Where are they? Oh. All right. <laughs> Hi, for those of you who don't know me remotely, I guess, I'm Lisa Adelie, you probably figured that out. Um, but I'm really excited to introduce to you our first speaker, who is Hannah Gaber. She is a, a graduate student in the dual master's degree program in journalism and in Middle Eastern North African studies um, here at the University of Arizona. She has recently returned from six months in Oman where she was doing research, um, filming for her final project and studying Arabic. And she's going to share some of her insights um, on, uh, in a talk entitled A Young Nation, Omani Culture and Youth. So please welcome Hannah Gaber. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. <coughs> massively flattered to be invited by Lisa, and um, I'm really excited for you guys. I know you've been sort of hearing a lot about Oman over the last couple week, days, week, weeks, and um, are you getting excited to go? Does it even feel real yet? <laughs> Don't worry, whatever you're imagining, it's not like that. It's, which is good. It's a good thing. It's totally different. So um, what I'm going to do might be a little different format from what you have had so far. Um, I'm not kind of your traditional academic. I'm, my BFA is in photography. I just want to travel. So I was like, maybe I'll be a journalist. I don't know. And that's kind of where we're at. And so, um, but I, I went to Oman a couple years ago, uh, over the winter of 2013-2014. It was a dual, it was a study abroad. It was uh, Oman and Dubai, kind of side by side. And especially that contrast for me was like, <laughs> Oman. I'll take Oman. And so, um, I just really fell in love with the place and determined at that time to go back. And it took me about two years of planning and logistics and fundraising and figuring out how to get myself there. Um, and I'm doing a documentary as my final project to complete my dual degrees. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys the opening sequence from the documentary, a little teaser. <coughs> Um, really just excited that I've even finished the lecture. And so, um, and then what I'll do is I'll just kind of, what I want to do is talk you through really like the day to day, what you'll see and experience on the street with the people in Oman. And I, I'll go through kind of basics and I'll give you some sort of, um, you know, basic, <clears throat> excuse me, backgrounding. But what I really want to do is answer any questions that you might have or concerns that you might have. Or, you know, maybe there's something else that you've learned about in a more academic sense and you're wondering how that manifests on the ground. I don't know, in particular, how Zanzibari Omanis might be differentiated within the population. Like when you meet a Zanzibari Omani, how is it different from when you meet a Bedouin Omani or whatever, for example? <coughs> Excuse me, so anything I can help with on that, I really want to give you guys a chance to kind of prepare yourselves. So, <coughs> without further ado, meet some Omanis. <coughs> My name is Abdullah Ahmad Sultan, Ahmad Sultan, Ahmad Sultan, Ahmad Hadri. My name is Khadija Ibrahim Mujahid. My name is Mohammed Salim, made Saeed al -Ukhavi. I'm 22 years old. My family is originally from Muscat, and I am Omani. And I'm Omani. And I am Omani. I am 21 years old, and I am Omani. I am Abdullah, and I am Omani. <laughs> For example, that you might see in the UAE that would be like, well, you know, we have oil 
also will be fine. Omanis are really, really aware that their oil reserves are slated to run out in 20, 15 to 20 years. And when you talk to your kind of basic Omani on the street, they're like, well, we have oil, but it won't last forever. But it's also kind of important to know that 15 to 20 years is the timeline that they've been given, and we've been given for 30 years. So, I mean, as the technology improves, there's better ways to harvest oil and that kind of thing. Um, and they've also become um, much more participating in the um, liquid natural gas industry. And minerals, they're big minerals. Gypsum, for example, is a big, um, big crop in Oman. But <clears throat> none of these things are sustainable, really. I mean, in the end, uh, we're talking about um, we're talking about a single source economy, which is not a sustainable thing. You, know, you can't really run an entire economy on oil or gypsum or liquid natural gas. You need more, and they're aware of that. Um, but of course. Being that basically the government took the reins of developing the country since 1970, they've been a huge player in the economy and continue to be. And getting the government out of the economy is a really tough shift, especially when surrounded by um, rente states, essentially, where you know the, the government basically pays the people and the people don't make a fuss and everyone kind of it's everyone has what they need and they continue. Um, but you are beginning to see things like that last. I don't know if you guys knew about this part. Um, it's an incredibly high ratio. Um, the population of Oman is about, it depends on who you ask, but 40 to 50 percent Omanis. So it's a really high um, foreigner population state. And it's one of those things that while there was a very warm and welcoming attitude towards, for example, the British played a huge role in developing, helping Oman develop. Um, very warm, welcoming, grateful attitude. Yes, thank you, expats, for coming in and helping us. There's beginning to be, as the youth bubble continues, there's beginning to be a feeling of kind of, why are you in my job? Why are you sitting in this office getting all this money from PDO, which is Petroleum Development Oman, which is a joint venture with British Petroleum, that is, <clears throat> why are you sitting in the office getting $150,000 a year, a house, a car, a stipend, your family lives here, your kids go to school for free, but I can't find a job. And this is a multifaceted problem, and, and part of it is that the education is not really up to par. Um, there's kind of a prevailing sentiment among the expats that run these companies, most of them are still run by expatriates, for example, um, especially mining and oil companies, that or partnered with the government, that. Uh, Omanis just leaving college, for example, are not terribly well prepared. They have a degree, but it doesn't really mean anything because there's really only one university, Sultan Qaboos University, <clears throat> and then there's all these technical colleges where Omanis can go if their grades aren't good enough to get into SQU. They can go to a technical college, they can get a vocational degree, and they're hireable. And this, by the way, is a huge improvement. So this is not to be sneezed at. This is real progress. But at the same time, you know, an Omani with a two-year Oman supplied degree versus an Omani that goes abroad and gets educated with a four-year degree, there's just no comparison. Or, for example, the foreigner who comes in with a formal education that has started since the time they were six uh, in a Western or even a really well-developed um, Southeast Asian, for example, system. There's a lot of Malaysian, um, there's a lot of Philippines, there's a lot of uh, Indian and Bangladeshi presence and Pakistani presence in Oman. Um, and of course, then there's the Westerners, the British, and the number one tourists that come to Oman from outside uh, the GCC are Germans. So you will meet a lot of German tourists while you're in Oman. And you'll be like, what? But there you go. So um, they have a really good uh, economic relationship. So <clears throat> this is going to be something that Oman is facing uh, right up until 2050, as you see. And um, <clears throat> it's just. It's just a huge challenge, and this is sort of the crux of my um, documentary, is basically looking at the changing Omani culture through the eyes and concerns of the youth, um, and using uh, kind of the economy and entrepreneurship to come at the changes that have begun, that have settled, how that's affected the place, and the changes that may and need to come. Yeah? That's the question. It says up there that the Omani population, 2013, it says 3.6 million at that time, around 4.5 million mm -hmm. now. That seems like a huge percent increase um, of a period of what, two, three years? Well, the, one of the things to keep in mind is that these, uh, these statistics are not always terribly accurate, and it depends on who's supplying them. So World Bank will have one set of statistics. The National Centers for Statistics and blah, blah, blah will have another one in Oman. 
Um, part of that is these countries often have, UAE does the same thing, they have an interest in inflating the number of, of, of nationals that live in their country. So, because um, they want to make it look like they're more like Omani or they're more Emirati than they really are. There's a, an, an, an interest in appearances in an international way. Part of it is that there's a little bit of wiggle room in the statistics themselves, but part of it is um, the fluctuation. Obviously, birth rates have a lot to do with it, as we're seeing here, that that's not going to stabilize till 2050. But also, um, influx of foreigners, depending on the laws and the price of oil, there's kind of a, a waxing and waning. Uh, presence of foreigners working and living. In <clears throat> so, you know, there's times where they, for example, right now they're issuing fewer and fewer work visas and living visas to expats. Expats are being kind of actively pushed out of Oman at the moment. Oil prices are very low and they really aggressively want to hire Omanis into a lot of those positions. Um, and so, you know, so for example, if we go back to this, this bottom part, this is something that if you ask Omani business development people, um, I spoke to quite a few of them, including private and public sector while I was there. They feel that those jobs should be held by Omanis, which is interesting, you know, because that means pushing people out of jobs. So, but they don't care because that's not their citizens, that's not their problem, which is, you know, a point. The, a lot of those jobs are low-skilled jobs, construction yes. jobs, but do Omanis want to do that? They do not. There is a very big problem with that. And so that's one of the major, major things that they're dealing with right now is like, how do we rewrite the expectations where it's like, you can be a business owner and run a construction company, but that means you have to work construction. You don't just hire all these Indian laborers and, you know, but that's the way the system works right now. If you see a construction site in Omani, in Oman, I would be shocked if you see an Omani on the site. Typically these companies, um, and they were established in the beginning by a lot of, um, you know, people from the Indian subcontinent or from Southeast Asia because they have a business background. <clears throat> and, you know, Oman had nothing development-wise in 1970 when Sultan Qaboos took over. And the culture, I mean, Sultan Qaboos University was 1980, I think it was 1980, was when it opened. So you didn't have your first generation of really, and really, college-educated Omanis even coming in until the 90s, really. And so <clears throat> the background in, <clears throat> excuse me, business and entrepreneurship in particular just didn't exist, with the exception, notably, for, for the most part, as an colleagues. So um, the Zanzibari population plays a really important and really interesting role in Oman to this day. Um, you typically, if you meet um, a Zanzibari Omani, typically you can tell because their English is outstanding. They may not even speak Arabic. If they do, they speak kind of a pidgin Swahili Arabic. Um, and many of them, I lived with a, actually with a Zanzibari uh, woman when I was in Oman. And it was really interesting. She was married to a Dutchman which is relatively unusual to see an Omani woman married to an expat man. It's not all that common. It's more common to see it the other way around. But she spoke English, her kids spoke English and Dutch, and a little tiny bit of Swahili, no Arabic. She spoke a little bit of Arabic. Her husband is Dutch and speaks English and Dutch. And so it was really interesting. You start to see, but the Zanzibaris tend to be more exposed to other cultures. They tend to be better educated. They tend to have more of a business background. Um, for example, uh, another young man that I met, actually same family, a little bit further, they were totally unrelated how I met them, but that's just Oman, it's really funny. Um, he, his brother, his father, his cousins, they all run different tours and businesses. And when you speak to, so for example, there's a lot of different, um, <clears throat> there's genuinely a plurality in Oman. There's Zanzibaris, there's Baluchis, there's, um, Persians, there's Bedouin, there's all these different uh, ethnic backgrounds, basically, living together in Oman. Truly, it is really quite peacefully, and they, they feel respected by their government for the most part. They feel provided for for the most part. Um, they do, they, you know, there's complaints about the quality of education and the availability of jobs, and we want to compete on an international stage, and that kind of thing. Um, but there's not really the whole, like, the Baluchis are being held down. It's just, there's not much of that. And, you know, inshallah, that will continue. Um, but, yeah. I understand what, like, the older generation, or it's people coming from other countries, when the guys are males doing different jobs, not learning Arabic and not having really a reason to learn it. But you were saying from this example, you can understand the Dutch husband, if he didn't want to learn Arabic, didn't probably need it. But right. you're talking about how their children even didn't learn Arabic. And I don't, I'm, um, I'm having, I've read some different things also about the language related 
thing. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what, what from the second generation or first generation being born there, it would be second now from Zanzibar, right? Having mm -hmm. a resistance to learning Arabic. I don't know. You know, it's not an act of resistance. It's just that it sort of never came up. They, they go to an international school. It's the PEO school. Um, they go to the um, international school. Um, so all the kids that they go to school with are of either expatriate or mixed marriages like their family. Um, and so everybody, the international language between all these different families is English. And the school teachers teach in English because they're generally expat teachers. And um, this is one of the problems that happens in the Omani school system, which is why so many young Omanis feel unprepared when they graduate college. They're like, but I don't know how to do anything yet. Because part of what happens is they go through their entire undereducation with sort of like schoolroom English being taught to them. They hit college and everything is in English. But it's typically taught by Indian professors with very thick accents, and there's a genuine disconnect. I mean, I sat in the classroom and watched the students just like, and they were, these were like third and fourth year engineering students, and they quite clearly had no concept. They like gave a presentation where they were like, this is the phrase you gave us, and this is the definition, and here's an example. And the professor was like, but what does that mean? And they were like, well, this is what it is. And I was like, oh, this is a problem. But that's what many, many, many of them told me, you know, so that it's Arabic, 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 and then boom, when they're expected to be adults and compete internationally, everyone's expected to speak English. So you'll notice when you go to Muscat, um, are you guys going, you're going all around Oman? Yes. Yeah. So there's a distinct difference. You will notice almost, if you're paying attention, you will hear a lot of Arabic, but in Muscat, if, even if they see you, Omanis are very, very considerate. They'll, oh, they'll switch to English. So in Muscat, almost everybody speaks English, at least enough, if not totally fluent. Taxi drivers, for example, I would get in a cab and say, you know, um, and where are you from? <laughs> and I was like, oh. You know, because they can tell that it's like a struggle for you. Their English is probably definitely better than my Arabic. Like, and they want to help, you know, and they tell you, where are you going? And what have you seen so far? And how can I help you? And, you know, um, you will have taxi drive. This happened to me uh, three times. Where are you going? How long have you been here? Have you seen this place? Oh, well, I'm from Nizwa here. Let's take my business card. Give me a call. You know, I'll take you around. Oh, thank you so much. How much do I owe you? No, 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 no problem. I mean, it's really, they want you to have a good impression of Oman. It's been impressed upon them how important tourism is for many, many years now. And it's important for them, especially with Americans, I think. They feel really strongly about showing you a peaceful, happy, prosperous, stable Arab country. They really want to make that impression. And, you know, rightly so. I would probably feel the same way if, if I saw the news coming out of the US. Um, so. Are the taxi cab drivers of money? Or are they. Always. Not by regulation. Much? Absolutely. Oh. Now, so for example, in the UAE, you'll never, ever see an Emirati driving a taxi cab. Um, in Dubai, I'd be surprised if you see an Emirati. But um, in Oman, to keep up, to make sure Omanis have jobs, mm -hmm. they 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 are the taxi cab drivers. Mm -hmm. There is a po policy called Omanization where businesses of different sectors must have a quota of a certain number of Omanis working for them. In the oil industry, for example, it's eighty percent. In the service industry, I think it's forty percent, but it just depends. But you have to employ at least one Omani in every single business. So it works and it doesn't. I mean, this this kind of thing is like. You know, you can't, you can lead a horse to water. But so you, what you'll see a lot of the time is you'll go into a gas station, there will be an Omani sitting at the register, but there's two or three, you know, almost always Indians working in the station. And when you ask for anything, they'll be the one to come up and ask you, what do you need? Can I help you? Can I help you find anything? Are you looking for this? Are you? They're the ones who are working, working, like working, working. But when you get up to the register, they hand everything to the Omani who brings you up. And it's, but it, it does provide jobs. But it's also a burden on the businesses that come there. So I mean, it's the two it's the two sides of the same coin. But the idea is exactly what you asked about, which is we need to get Omanis to understand that a cashier position is a job, that working in a gas station is a job. If you want a job, you don't always get to pick what job it is. You don't always get to just sit in an office and collect a paycheck and go home at three. Like that's just not how it works. But that is how the government sector works. So a lot of people aspire towards the government sector. A, stability, it's big. This is a very family-centric society. They want a job that will provide them with a pension, that they can be home at three, that they can take care of their kids, and that they have you know, job security. It's also almost impossible to fire an Omani if you hire an Omani in, in your business.
this from outside. You have to give them a year probationary period. You have to cite what they did wrong. You have to tell them. You have to give them an opportunity to fix it. And then you have to try again. There's a whole process. So it is burdensome for businesses who feel that they're forced to hire people who are unqualified. And it's burdensome for Omanis who would rather work for the government. But there's not, the government cannot produce 20 to 40,000 jobs a year to hire graduates. It's just no government can do that. So, <clears throat> so this is kind of the moment that Oman is in at this time. Um, but so again, so in Muscat, you'll notice almost everybody speaks some amount of English. When you go into the interior, you'll hear lots of Arabic. <clears throat> lots and lots of Arabic. But the kids of the expats and the kids of the mixed marriages, English is the lingua franca. No pun intended. Because that's how they can move within international circles, and those are the circles uh, within which they move. So let's see. Um, I kind of, kind of covered this. But so for example, the Zanzibaris have historically been placed in a very advantageous position for this, because since returning to, to Oman, mostly in the 80s and 90s, they brought with them this culture, A, of being a diasporic community, which means that you have to learn whatever you can to make yourself useful, including foreign languages and English, especially. Um, and they, many of them were Omanis who went to Zanzibar, maybe intermarried with the population. Some did not and came back. Many of the very wealthy Omanis, um, for example, the family, the Saidi family, that founded the Center for International Learning where I studied Arabic, uh, they came back from Zanzibar. Mr. Saidi still spends three months there a year. And so they're very connected internationally and they move in circles of international business, much more so I think than the kind of really tribally centered family that is like from Oman, while although those guys hold higher places in government, for example. So there's a distinction. The Center for International Learning is organizing our state. <laughs> Are you guys so who's uh, working with you? There's been some turnover since I left there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now I guess Elsa. Oh, great. Yay. OK, well, enjoy. They're really great. Um, so uh, another distinction, for example, in Muscat, you will see, you will see men in dishdashes. You will see women in abayat. You will see tons of youth in Western clothing. Everybody's on a smartphone. They are super active on Snapchat, Instagram, and WhatsApp. And so just for practical advice, WhatsApp is your tool of the trade. If you don't have it, download it right now and get familiar with it. Everybody uses WhatsApp in Oman. It's not unusual to meet somebody in a store, and obviously they'll, you're, no offense, you guys are clearly not Omani. So they're gonna walk up to you, this will happen to you all the time. Hello, welcome to Oman, where are you from? Immediately, and just, this is one of the things that as an American especially, we like have to get used to. This kindness is real. They don't wanna get anything out of you, they're not trying to sell you anything, you know, it's, welcome to Oman, I'm so glad you're here, where are you from? What have you seen so far? Have you seen blah, blah, blah? Well, I'm from that village. Take my number. Mm -hmm. This will happen to you, like for sure. Accept the number. Even if you never get a chance to, oh, I'm here with a group and we have a structured trip. That's fine, that's fine. Well, maybe in Muscat we can, I'll take you for coffee. They just want to tell you. They just want to share. They want to be the one to show you. You know, and the, the, the type of person who will walk up to you and introduce themselves is also the type of person who would like to be the one to show you around. They, you may be invited to their home for dinner. Accept the invitation if you have the flexibility to do so. Bring a friend, just if you're not comfortable, I mean, that's fine. Especially for women, I think it's always well advised, um, especially if you're invited by a man, because they have the social freedom to invite you. <coughs> but it's maybe not the best idea to go as a solo woman to a man's invitation. Just, you know, it's no big deal, but maybe, maybe okay to go anywhere. Yeah. Oh, is it okay if I bring my friend? She's really curious too. Of course, of course. They take their obligation as hosts very, very seriously. Um, they're very open to talking about, first of all, they want to talk about Islam, which is really interesting. And one thing that I noticed about, especially, which is fascinating to me, Oman youth, they're very, very well educated about their religion. This is not like, you know, um, some places I, you know, I wouldn't dare mention any, make this generalization. But where, for example, maybe more cosmopolitan people, like in the US, are maybe a little more secular, and they're like Muslim, but they kind of don't really, you better believe that most of the Omani youth that I came to know personally, and there were a lot, they were up at 5.30 to pray every single day. This, this is the thing that they do. They go to the mosque on Fridays. Everything shuts down on Fridays, for real, for real. People are praying, and they are with their families, and they take it seriously. So, you know, it's important to sort of 
code switch enough that you're respectful of that, but don't be afraid. Omanis are pretty, especially in Muscat, are pretty accustomed to Westerners kind of floating through their space. They want you not to misunderstand. They, if you have questions, for example, about Islam, and like, oh, I noticed that you're, you know, that's a really beautiful mosque. Oh, that's a Sultan Qaboos mosque. Did you know that there are 52 of them being built? His Majesty started building them, and blah, 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 blah. And it's really important. You can go in, you know. Would you like to go? You know, it's, it, that would be how it, how it goes. If you have questions, do ask them. They would like to clear it up for the most part. Yeah. Are people allowed, foreigners, allowed to go in the mosque during Ramadan? Um, yeah. I, yeah. It's not, uh, so I was in Oman during Ramadan, and where we, <clears throat> one thing is, it's illegal to eat on the streets, as it is in most places during Ramadan. You cannot eat in public. Um, there's, it's very quiet, not much is happening. So um, as long as you're not there during prayer time, for the most part, mosques are open spaces. You know, um, don't go during prayer, don't go on Fridays. Just, I wouldn't. I mean, you can, for the most part, like the Sultan Qaboos Grand Mosque in, in the city. Do I have a picture of you guys? Did I change that one? Did you? Yeah. So at the Grand Mosque, for example, you can just sort of show up. And they have hours, you know, they close before prayer at noon. Um, but, you know, pretty much any day you can go in. And I, they, I can't remember if they're closed all day on Fridays or only, or if they open in the afternoons. But all of this is posted. They, they keep you guys relatively well informed. Not all of their informational systems are totally functioning, but you can always ask people and they're pretty, they, people, this is one of those funny societies where people kind of know more things than the official like website or whatever will say. Because it might be different. It could be that today, oh no, we're not doing that this week because there's a blah, blah, blah. And it won't be posted on the website, but people will know. So talk to people, that's the best advice I can give you. Really, truly, make use of how friendly, how warm the these are. Um, <coughs> you may note, um, there is a very real sort of expectation of certain types of behavior that is not, uh, is not really normal for us, and we're not just talking about clothing. There is the, have you guys talked about any of that stuff yet? No, could you say something about how women can dress because Absolutely. I'm struggling? You are not expected to cover your hair. They do not expect you. They say, you know, we respect your culture and we would like you to respect ours. Yeah, but in a mosque, you have to in a mosque. Yeah. Oh yes, get in without your cover. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And in the mosques, women should be covered from wrists to ankles and hair. So keep that in mind. They will not let you in. For example, the Sultan Qaboos, even the Grand Mosque, <coughs> only tourists. If you're, I, I came with a three-quarter sleeve one time. And I had to leave. Get a sweater. Be prepared for that. Wrists to ankles. Wear sandals all day long. Sandals are the national shoe, as they will tell you at CIL. It's really, everybody wears sandals. It's great. So that's my thing. I was like, yeah. But, um, except for when you go hiking, wear sneakers, obviously. But um, in general, women are expected to do not, you can't, like this, I would not wear in Oman. I would cover, I would just wear a scarf. I would just drape it around my neck. These I probably wouldn't wear. Elbows is fine. Wrists is better. Three quarter sleeves is lovely. Um, certainly below the knee, you want to be covered. Uh, they'll tell you, oh no, no, whatever you want. And this is re something really important to note about Omanis, especially those that are in the role of hosting foreigners who they know have never been here before, may never come back. They'll not say or do anything to make you feel uncomfortable, except in situations where they have to, like the mosque, where it's like you can't. But for the most part, if you are not especially shoulders, if your shoulders or, and your legs are showing, you are making people uncomfortable. And you are making a spectacle of yourself. And to be honest, it's kind of rude. And <laughs> you just don't need to. So you just don't need to. And um, it's amazing how even after a couple of days of being in that society, you'll go to, like, if you go to one of the expat grocery stores, like in the wave, where everybody's British and, and, or German or Dutch, they, you'll see women walking around in tank tops and shorts, and you're like, <gasps> So, oh my god, you know, and it's just so funny how quickly you'll acclimate, but um, it's very startling. And so just don't be that person if you can avoid it. Men too, I mean, men men wear shorts. Omanis oh, don't really wear shorts. You, you might see them on their off day wearing a pair of shorts and sandals and a t-shirt, but for the most part, it's pretty modest. How, what about, you know, it's really hard in the United States. I found, when I'm thinking about going to Iran, I mean, to Oman, to find, There's some to, Iran in Oman. <laughs> to find clothes that have a high enough neckline um, are, are 
you know, thick enough and to have sleeves. Now, how low a neckline? Can you wear a neckline like this? I would keep it to here. Okay, so this I would say above neck. the collarbone. Yeah. Out of real above consideration for all eyes. So the best advice that I can give you is develop your skirt. Always carry a scarf. Always, always. Even during Ramadan, we had scarves around our necks. It's a. It's great to have in case you find yourself in a situation where you have an opportunity to go somewhere, but you might need to cover your head. Don't miss the chance to go somewhere because you weren't prepared. That's a bummer. It's a huge bummer. So always, always. And and for me, because I'm an American too, you know, like I'm buying t-shirts. T-shirts are t-shirts. Excuse me. Even my like normal what's here, like a normal V-neck T-shirt, just like this. That's not appropriate. You would need a little sweater, and you would need. I would just wear personally. I would have a scarf, and I would just wrap it so that it just covers. And I have two or three. Like I, I deal in solid colors, and I deal in neutrals, and it's a great thing, you know. So I have my one scarf that goes with my black outfits, and then I have my one scarf that's just the solid blue, and then I have my one scarf that's like red and gold, and now we're good. So whatever, you can always just carry one. They just appreciate a the gesture of being respectful, and B, not having that kind of thing distract from their time to interact with you. And it is a distraction, it's not nice. You know, it's kind of, you know, if I were to show up to this classroom with a bunch of cleavage, that would also be distracting, you know, and it's sort of a similar, it's not necessarily outlawed, but it's, it's not the most considerate way to behave. So, um, it's kind of that sort of similarity. So, um, and there is, this is really, really funny, there's also an age distinction for women. So if you're of what's considered marriageable age, you, you need to be even more careful. So let's say, me, I, I mean, I had one experience where I went into the village and the girl was like, 32 and you're not married? You missed the train. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So where they draw those lines is a little different. But um, for example, if you don't look like you could like get married and have kids in the next year to them, then it's definitely, you want to cover past your elbows probably, you want to make sure your hair is covered. Whenever it's, you know, and there's some households that to go into, you should, it's nice to ask if they invite you into the home, do you want me to cover my hair? And if they say, oh, that would be lovely, then, well, shoot, you know, but typically they'll be like, no, 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 no problem, no problem. Be prepared to take off your shoes before entering anyone's home. If you're invited into a meal with mixed company, um, that's lovely. It's unusual and be aware of that. Um, oftentimes that won't happen. It'll be, you know, thank you, join us, and we'll have coffee and dates together, and then the women will go with the women to eat, and the men will sit with the men to eat. Um, and typically it's different rooms, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just two different groups. And they'll sort of coach you through it. Omanis typically, especially in a home setting, do eat on the floor with their hands. Um, everybody eats with the right hand. It is rude to pass or eat anything with your left hand. And that is no joke. I mean, like, don't accept it. If someone offers you a cup of coffee, which will happen to you a lot, don't accept it with your left hand. Oh, just, just, this doesn't work. It doesn't go, it doesn't do anything anymore. Do everything basically. It took me like three weeks when I got back to adjust to like interacting with people with my left hand. It was very uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> other little things, you know, just sort of behave as if you were, you know, at church or synagogue or mosque with your grandma and her friends. That's a really good kind of guideline. How, what would make grandma feel really, really comfortable? I'm like, I'm being a really good kid right now. You know, that's a really kind of baseline for, for behavior. Um, you might see Omanis in mixed company. It's not particularly common. For example, if you go to the mall, which I'm sure you will, you'll end up, if you're working with CIL, you'll be in C. So you'll be probably at the, um, uh, not the Grand Mall, that's in the center. City Center is the biggest mall in Oman. And it's great because it's right in the seat. There's a big Starbucks there. You'll see tables of women, tables of men. You might see a family, which would be mommy, daddy, babies, which is really cute. Um, and don't be alarmed if you see, and you will, uh, a domestic servant with them. It's very, very common in the Gulf. It's almost unheard of that a family would not have a live-in maid or blah, 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 and they're almost exclusively for living. It's going to sound kind of weird, but like for guys for our uh, sleep length, Things like that. Short sleeves is okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Short sleeves is okay. But not, not tank tops. Not tank tops. No bro, no bro <laughs> tank tops, guys. <laughs> Keep your frat boy tank tops at home. <laughs> but for example, what he's wearing is perfectly adequate. Perfectly fine. And even if you were wearing shorts, nice shorts, you'd, you'd be okay. There are some settings where it's not appropriate. I personally would just steer away from it altogether, just to err on the side of caution. And more than caution, really just being considerate. 
Because you will know in the first two days, the first day that you're there, the Romanis are terribly considerate. They're incredibly good hosts. They, again, they take their responsibility as hosts very, very seriously. They want to give you a good impression. To my mind, it's the least we can do to return that thoughtfulness in our own conduct. Um, um, and one of the, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, well, in a lot of places, it, it's, it's not just a modesty thing, it's a class thing. Absolutely. Um, laborers show their needs. This is very true. Professionals do not. And so it's, it's, it's a very class conscious thing as well. You'll see the Indians in tank tops and in shorts, and the Omanis are like, and it's like, oh, God, that's uncomfortable. You know, as Americans, we find that stuff very uncomfortable. You said that about people, um, you'll see them sitting separately. What about when we eat in public? Is it? They won't think anything of it. They won't mind? You do whatever you want to do. You're clearly not from there. OK. Yeah. Even, for example, if you were to you know, walk into a shopping mall in like, tight jeans, which is a no-no, by the way. Oh, yes, not that. I'm like, I have So this, this is not something I would, I would wear this mom on with a sweater that would cover teeth. Yeah, I only have skin. <laughs> you can wear, so, so you can wear skinny jeans if you need to, but you need to wear a tunic or some whatever kind of top. So like I said, I would wear this in Oman because this is not form-fitting, but I would wear it with a sweater that covers my butt and a scarf that covers my chest. Yes, you do. But you know what I did before I went is I went to uh, Twice as Nice and I stocked up on a bunch of cheapy, flowy, you know, whatever kind of cool shirts. And I threw them all away when I got back because <laughs> A, they were destroyed, and B, I would just never wear them here. But yes, be aware of that. So for women, pants are fine? Pants are fine. Okay. But um, I would basically, the guideline is don't wear things that show your form. Don't wear things that show your body shape. That's the guideline. So wear loose fitting shirts. Um, if you only have, you know, so I wear, I always have a tank top under my shirt. Um, but I would never wear just the tank top with a sweater. You know what I mean? Even though it technically covers my shoulders, even though I could put a scarf on and it technically covers my, you know, decolletage, I would never wear that because it's warm today. And it's rude. And they don't want to see it. And that's what they consider it. So basically the guideline is whatever, if it shows your body shape, it's, it's inconsiderate. It's a distraction and they feel like it's not appropriate. So that's, that's a good guideline to go by. So like flowy skirts that go. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, I'm the queen of the maxi skirt. Yeah. Lead, yes, <laughs> maxi skirts all day. Well, yeah. Even the men wear dresses. Come on, it's super hot. <laughs> well, this is, I was going to say is, you know, I mean, this is also about, about comfort, for free flowing is your and natural oh fibers. No, no polyesters. You know, I'm totally. About cotton, linen, and linen. Do it. <laughs> Do the it's, linen. You know, thing. don't wear you know, jeans. It's just. It's like wearing jeans and juice on them. Just to let, no, it's worse <laughs> because it's like 80% humidity. Yeah, yeah. So let me just tell you guys that I was there during Ramadan last summer and it was 130 degrees and 90% humidity. The last thing I was wearing was skinny jeans. Believe me. It was like, oh my God. It was, so, but by the way, if you want to get, and you can plan, I wish I had kind of known this, they do have at the um, Scott um, City Center Mall, they, which is probably the first place CIO will take you. Um, <clears throat> and you can go on your own time. You can catch a cab. They're really cheap. But bargain with them. You don't have meters. So, um, yeah, and they will. It's not like, oh, money's are nice, but come on. Like, business is business. So, they, it's, it's uh, great that you can go to the H&M there and buy, like, super flowy, comfy pants that are appropriate to the climate because guess what, you know? So, like, just walk right past the jeans, go straight to the back where they're like, Flowy black linen, like drawstring, and by the way, it feels like wearing jammies all day, which is the best. So there's things. There's so if you want to, you know, have two or three good outfits to get you through the first couple of days, with like plan on maybe going shopping one night. Plus, it's a great way to see Omani culture and see what Omani is like just hanging out. Cause Seed is a is a suburb essentially. So, um, and this is one other thing I wanted to mention because it confused me for two weeks before someone realized I didn't know this basic information. Muscat is a governorate. It is not a city. So when people say, where are you staying in Muscat? You're going to be like, in Muscat. You're not. You're staying in C. The way that this went when the, si the state was being developed <coughs> was Omanis were quite literally camel herders, fishers, fishermen, fishers, fishermen, um, craftsmen, date farmers. They lived in villages that were essentially tribally and family-centric. 
Um, so for example, Matra, which is like the center, this port that you saw at the end of the film, is the Matra port, which was the port for the royal family. The, His Majesty's yacht remains there. You will see it when you go. And they will point it out to you. They're quite proud of it. It looks like a cruise ship. It's beautiful. But and it sits next, next to a destroyer, which all my military friends were like, what? That's amazing! Anyway, so um, that was the traditional port that was used by the royal family <coughs> and for trade before Oman was really developed. That's this kind of center of the heart of like old Muscat, but it's Matra. That's a specific place. The name of that village is Matra. Right next to Matra, we'll have all these other villages like Boshar, Adeba, um, Gala, Rubra. These are the names of what we maybe think of now as like neighborhoods, but they are genuinely villages that were swallowed up as the metropolis began to develop. So the governorate is called Muscat, but you won't be living in Muscat. You won't be staying in Muscat. You'll be staying in sea in Muscat. So if you're outside, if you're in um, Sohar, are you guys going to Sohar? Yes. I don't, yes. Yes? <laughs> Which is great. Sohar is quickly becoming uh, Oman's second city. Um, it kind of always has been, but um, because they moved the commercial port there. And it's really beginning to develop, and what you're seeing is a lot of expats are beginning to move there because, for example, trade and oil development and LNG and all that stuff is coming and going um, out of Sohar now, where it was once in the past. But um, it's also kind of the gateway to the UAE. So a lot of families that live in Sohar have family in the UAE, and they they because it's the same tribe. Because it's kind of and you'll hear Omani say like, "Oh, the Emiratis, but they're Omanis." And what that is, is that the UAE came from one of the secessionist movements that His Majesty decided to basically peacefully resolve with their family tribes, the Emir, uh, as are the Sheikh, um, of whom you may have heard of, if you haven't people. <clears throat> and so basically, and they love him. They absolutely adore him, they respect him, they feel he united the Bedouin, and as a result, they got their own country, and it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And many, 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 many tribes in Oman are Bedouin. And they're related, for the most part. So um, it's nice to know, but uh, where was I going with this? There was a question here about something, so I can't remember. <laughs> I have another question. <coughs> yes, please. So 130 degrees and 90% humidity. Is the indoor space is all air conditioned? All of them. Oh. You, like during Ramadan, you don't even see all mines in the street until like 5 p.m. because they're just not happy. They're just like, forget it. Plus, they also sleep till 2. There's a different schedule during Ramadan, but you're not going to be there during Ramadan, right? No, you, you are? Extended. For two weeks. The whole time? No, two weeks. We're there for four, four weeks. Oh, but you're in Zanzibar for half the time, right? No, we're in Zanzibar for a week. Okay. Ramadan rules. Dress even more conservatively. Um, again, just keep a scarf with you. Just keep one with you. Yes, it's 130 degrees. CIL, you're going to walk out of the building, your glasses will go poof. And you'll have to go eh. And you'll like hustle as quickly as you can to the other building and you'll get in there and the air conditioning will hit you and you'll go. <gasps> <laughs> I want to say something about this climate. Yes. That's only the stuff, the humidity. When you go inland, it's dry. In this one, there was no yeah. humidity. <coughs> I don't know if I say no humidity. humidity. Excuse me? It's still more humid than here, but it's not like that. But yeah. it's pretty dry. I was in this Much summer. more dry. Yeah, yeah, it's not like Muscat. It's much harder. Muscat yeah. is like, I sort of sourly joke about how it's like it has all the worst of all the best things about Oman. So it's like, it has the beach, but it doesn't have a breeze. It has the humidity, but it doesn't get the rain. It has, so it's like where you'll get rain in other parts of the country more commonly than this stuff, but it still floods there really badly when it rains. Can yeah. I say something else, please? What you will not see in Oman is body piercing and tattoos. Nobody has that, not that I've ever seen any Oman being uh, adorned. And another thing, if you want to take pictures, I don't know. Make sure you ask permission. Mm -hmm. You do not go take pictures just because you know something. When were you there? As attractive. I worked there for four years in Israel. Well. When when were you? When was 2009 to 15. Oh okay. Well, I see. Just so you know, this may have changed, but I see a ton of white piercings. You don't see tattoos. You see a lot of nose rings on women, especially obviously not on men. But a lot. A few. Oh yeah. No, yeah. a lot. Especially in Muscat. A lot of girls have their nose rings now. And in the interior, <coughs> for example, a lot of the older Bedouin women have tons of nose piercings. Well, they something. don't have tons. They, may, they maybe have one, and they have a tattoo, maybe the women. Right. I actually didn't even see the tattoos. I was kind of yeah. hoping to see more of those. But so for in Sohar, for example, the Bedouin families that I got to know, most of the older women had nose piercings. 
and it was gold, and it was. But this is an older tradition, so it's not. It's not in the same way like I have mine by your city. Um, you don't see tattoos, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, especially the men don't have them, because you don't see their bodies. Um, and some of them, it's really interesting. There's like this funny youth movement of like bodybuilding is like a big thing. It's really really funny, and those guys sometimes do have tattoos, and you'll see them in their pictures and whatever. But um, again, that's like it's not. It's away from the general. You won't see it like walking down the street. They're imitating Western culture. Absolutely, yeah. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying: is like you'll see every single young person there with a with a smartphone. You'll see, I'm, honestly, most older people as well. And everybody has one now. They love to share pictures. They want to talk to you and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, I should point out that the whole tattoo thing <coughs> is actually it's it's considered if not haram, it's not haram, um, uh, inadvisable. Mm -hmm. Um, I would think on women it's in, all basically forbidden, yeah. Well, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just talking, I'm talking about Islamic fit. Oh, I see. jurisprudence. Um, tattooing is, is, is considered, it, it's, it's at the very least considered inadvisable, if not actually forbidden, forbidden practice. Um, you do see it, you know, among, you know, Bedouin culture, a lot mm -hmm. of women tattooing. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is facial tattooing. The only place I know. Um, but in... Um, in, in a strict jurisprudential sense, it is consistent. So that a lot of studies, especially now in, in, in more scripturalist reformist climate that you see emerging today, um, it's very frowned because it does have this history within Islamic jurisprudence of being, um, you know, again, if not forbidden, then, then suspicious or you know, there's a third legal. There are three legal categories. There's um, there's halal, which is acceptable and advisable, and there's haram, which is forbidden, which everybody knows about. But there's actually a third category in the middle called makara, which is meh inadvisable. <laughs> you really shouldn't. <laughs> so, and I, I'm not sure where tattooing falls on that, that whether it's haram or makara, but um, it probably you know, depends but, on who you ask. Probably depends yeah, on which. It depends on the legal school, but um, yeah, it could just depend on the legal school, but. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, there is there is a a a, a legal reason uh, within Islamic um, theology and jurisprudence about tattooing of being a taboo law. Mm -hmm. What's so, the term again for their little category? Uh, Makruh. Uh, uh, quick millennial question. So, <laughs> as, as to technology and cell phones, would you recommend? Would we be able to buy, say, a SIM card for our iPhone? Absolutely. There. Hey, you don't care for. Yeah, I was just gonna say I recommend getting it from a Montel as soon as you get it. Yeah. Absolutely. Or what's the other one? Is another Rosa Redo, but it's a Kuwaiti company. So there's a new, new. Oh, something. Oh, the friend that was suggesting. No hotel is that what you said? No Montel. Montel. Yeah, El Montel. Yeah, that's the one that we were saying. And the same goes for internet access quality. Internet access. So there will be a lot of Wi-Fi available in a lot of places, and um, oftentimes you'll have to ask for a password. Uh, but if you have a smartphone, like I did not get a SIM card for my iPhone while I was there. I, I like borrowed a phone from a friend, but again, I was there long enough to like make friends to like I, you know, borrow a phone from for five months. Um, and just, it was like an Android, it drove me crazy. But I had the SIM, phone, SIM card in it just to make phone calls, um, which was not that common. And, but because everybody uses WhatsApp for the most part, um, almost nobody just texts. So Wi-Fi is kind of, you'll be, you'll have pretty much where, whatever you need and if you have um, an AT&T phone service, you can get free texting service abroad. And that's what I do whenever I travel, because then I can text somebody. Then you'd have to pay more to call, but... Yeah, yeah calls are like 50 cents or a dollar a minute, so maybe yeah. avoid that if you can. But again, almost nobody uses the phone for calling. They all, everybody texts and they all use WhatsApp, so... Yeah. Any, your day to day on the streets primer to oh, 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 another, another thing. Uh -huh. so, it's not, it's not, yeah. But AT and T ones. So I'm gonna have to my iPhone. To avoid having to bargain about lots of stuff like taxis, ask somebody that you know lives there. Ask them how much is it from here to there, and then just give them the money. So you don't have to bargain and hurry. Right. That works. Yeah, and definitely ask like <clears throat> if you have a friendly Omani that you and you'll have a ton of them that you'll meet through this, the program or whatever. 
Um, for example, <clears throat> oh, hey, we're staying in blah, 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 and we want to go to the Grand Mall later, or to the uh, whatever city, so wherever you want to go. How much should a taxi be? So like, arm yourself with that knowledge beforehand from a local, because they'll know. Because if you get in there like, hey, real, you're like, that's ridiculous, too. They'll be like, mm, three real. And you're like, fine. You know, but also keep in mind that reals are, are um, 2.6 to the dollar, and that doesn't change. It's paid to the American dollar. And have the right amount of change. Just have change in your pockets all the time. So I think that's it for me. Do you guys have any other questions? One question about, I don't know if we're taking tra uh, public transportation as a group ever. You, there's really none to take. Okay. Yeah, there's there's the base of buses, but it's almost, they're ex almost exclusively used by like the workers. Okay. No, I've been on them all the time yeah. in Alaska. I just wonder, sometimes Americans or foreigners are louder than usual. Well, that was actually something I meant to bring up, and I'm glad you said that. Um, for the most part, you will notice, like, we in general are going to be always the loudest people in the room. Uh, generally try to always bear in mind, you know, speak in soft tones. It's not a loud place. People don't yell at each other. They don't, you know, if you hear a commotion at, in any form, people will be like, you know, because it's just not gregarious in that way. I remember um, traveling in Colombia, slamming a car door was really to people, everyone's just really careful about how you close. So things like that uh, might pop out. Well, it cracks me up because, and, and the Omanis that I made friends with like loved it. When I, I was like, what is the problem? Like you guys are the nicest people in the world until you're driving, and then you're just all jerks. And they're like, ah, I want to tweet that. That's so funny. And then it was like, what? And they drive like crazy people. It's like it's the scariest. And traffic accidents, as far as I know, is still the leading cause of death. But um, yeah, so the base of buses is the only real form of public transportation, and um, base is what they call their change. So it's like coins, it's change buses. And you know, a lot of laborers take them, certain locals who've lived there, for, or expats who've lived there for a long time take them. You don't see a lot of Omanis taking them, but you do from time to time. You know, just, everybody does whatever they need to do, so. And there's no tipping. There, there, there can be, especially because, and it just depends on the context, um, but as foreigners, they kind of know, especially Americans, they kind of know that Americans are used to tipping, but it's not the way we do it here. So for example, if you, if, if like I would always give 100 besa to the guys who pump my gas if they clean my windshield. And it's a full, it's like a service economy. So if you pull into a gas station, you will not pump your own gas. There will be someone sitting at the pump and will take care of it. They, if you ask them to, they'll clean your windshield. And so I would give them 100 besa, which is like not even a quarter. So, you know, and it's just kind, you know, it's not a significant amount of money, but it's just to be kind. And um, so you can leave 100 besa or 500 besa if you go to like a restaurant and have an extravagant meal and there's like 20 of you, and blah, 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 blah. If you want to leave a real or two, then that's just very generous of you. But it's not, you don't have to, but it is okay. But if you leave too much, it, it, they might chase you down and get it back. Is it 1,000 besa or real? Yes. 1,000 besa. Mm-hmm. You probably have someone who can answer more about it than I can do. Regarding youth culture in particular, is there anything you need? But thank you very much. My very big Okay, just 2.6 dollars.